member of Indian Chess Society, European Respiratory Society, etc. And currently he is associated with AMRI Hospitals, Kolkata. Next, we have amongst us Dr. P. S. Thampi, who is also an eminent consulted pulmonologist with over 30 years of experience. Currently, he is a consultant at Bombay Hospital and Medical Research Center. He has 35 national and international publications to his credit and authored several chapters in respiratory medicine. Now I would request our eminent chairperson to kindly proceed over the session by introducing our speakers to our audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. At the outset, I must... Uh, oh. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, at the outset, uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Partha uh, Bhattacharya for his dynamic personality uh, and organizing uh, so many interesting academic sessions where all of us can learn from each other and progress our uh, knowledge and skills. So having said that, this module 9 is intended to target pneumothorax All other members are kindly requested to mute themselves. Only the person who will be speaking, they will only unmute themselves. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, uh, at the outset of this module on pneumothorax and hydropneumothorax, uh, Dr. A.G. Ghoshal, sir, will approach to a case-based approach to the management. Sir needs no introduction to this August gathering. Uh, sir is a uh, MD, DNB, FCCP, and ex-WHO fellow. He's a fellow of the Indian Chess Society, an ex-president Indian Chess Society, consultant pulmonologist with more than 30 years of medical and teaching experience. He's a revered teacher academician and researcher. His special interest, area of interest are airway diseases, lung diseases, drug resistant TB, sleep disorders. Currently, sir is the medical director, NABI, Kolkata. Over to you, sir, for your delivery on the case-based approach to pneumothorax and hydropneumothorax. So, thank you for these kind words. Just holding this. Okay. Now, we have a very good faculty here, actually. So, I'll start from here. Actually, what I saw from this program that you have a very good technical support. I'm talking of my fellow panelists. So one expert for intercostal tube drainage. One will take care of persistent air leak. Another will go for prolysis. So my job will be to focus on the problem. Solutions are in their hands. So first, thank everyone, particularly Partho, for this bringing all together and I am seeing some of my next generation experts here. Good to see them and talk to them in this pleasant evening. And so pneumothorax is just air in the plural cavity. And when we talk of air in the plural cavity, there is an idea that plural is a potential space. It is not a potential space actually. It's a real space. So there is a real space between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. And when air enters here, it is known as pneumothorax. Now how air can enter? Before that, there was a funny notion among the anatomists in the last century that pleura is a luxurious organ of human body. And example was given of the elephant who has no pleura. But present day physiologists have come up with explanations because nature does not do anything unnecessary. So, Pura has predominantly 
a buffering effect both anatomically and physiologically to protect the lung and to help it function smoothly. Now the pressure in plural space is negative throughout the respiratory cycle. And it happens because of outward pull of the chest wall versus elastic recoil of the lung. This is my sketch, so cannot be very good. And so what you see here, normally the outward recoil of the chest wall is balanced by inward recoil of the lung. This inward recoil of the lung is due to a particular arrangement of its fibers known as the geodesic pattern like a spring. So left to itself, it will recoil to the minimum volume. So the lung wants to go inside, the chest wall wants to go outside. There is an in-between so-called say mutual. This mutual is the FRC, functional residual capacity. And because of the two pools of the opposite direction, the pura remains negative pressure throughout the respiratory cycle. And all the changes, anatomical changes of pneumothorax that we detect by physical examination is a result of this lack of loss of negative pressure. So when a communication develops between an alveolus or other interpulmonary air space and plural space, air will flow into the plural space until there is no longer a pressure difference but the communication is sealed. Same thing may happen from outside also, traumatic pneumothorax, again, the plural pressure will be equalized with the atmospheric pressure until there is no longer a pressure difference or the communication is sealed. So what happens when there is air in the plural cavity? The first thing is the lung recoils. The lung recoils means there is loss of vital capacity. So beforehand, if the lung is healthy, it can survive this onslaught, this loss of vital capacity. But if the lung itself is not healthy with low vital capacity, even minimal loss of vital capacity due to a pneumothorax can be disastrous. So our whole approach to pneumothorax, spontaneous pneumothorax is based on this concept, primary or secondary. Now, in the last century, even I would say 20 years back, we were taught that there are apical blip or bulla which is due to the persistent moon negative pressure pleura at the up at the top and they rupture and produce pneumothorax. It is a long held belief. Now, what is the difference of a blab and a bulla? So blabs are blister like air pockets that form on the surface of the lung. Bulla is the term used for air filled cavities within the lung tissue. So, this is actually a blip because the outer side is contiguous with the pleura. Any rupture will lead into air in the pleural cavity. So this is, is a blip and bulla will be inside. I'll show you a bulla also here. There is something more in X-ray. In this X-ray, we'll show you, we'll discuss later. But this is a bulla compared to the other one is a blip. And it was a long held belief that the rupture caused pneumothorax. So apparently we did a chest x-ray PA view and we see whether there is any discernible anatomical abnormality, radiological abnormality in that chest x-ray. If it is there, we think this is secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. And if it is not there, we think it is a primary spontaneous pneumothorax or spontaneous pneumothorax in a healthy lung. But the distinction between the two, primary versus secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, is becoming increasingly blurred because the imaging has improved a lot and they show that even patients with so-called primary actually present with subtle pulmonary abnormalities. Now, blaves and bulla are there. They have been universally found during imaging, surgery, or medical thoracoscopy, but also has been found persistent pro-parenchymal abnormalities diffuse. So not a single point, a diffuse pro-parenchymal abnormality in addition to blab and bulla, and a diffuse plural porosity with element of small airway bronchiolitis. So small airway bronchiolitis 
produces the air trapping bulb like effect and the plural porosity gives the ultimate rupture producing pneumothorax the exact part is difficult to discern so the site of exact leakage is often hard to assess this has been seen when someone tries to block it by say a bronchobronchial fistula and as mucking causes this small airway bronchiolitis it increases many fold the relative risk of pneumothorax with a dose response relationship so what happens the lung recoils so the lung volume decreases and as the lung volume decreases the air spaces get collapsed so initially there is low ventilation compared to perfusion so low vq and then ultimately it sunt only perfusion no ventilation in the unlikely event of developing a positive pressure it is not common while well, positive pressure means it will compress blood vessels and heart ultimately may decrease impair the venous return decrease the cardiac output and end organ effect will produce hypotension fortunately this development of positive pressure is uncommon so this is the classification where i want to particularly here okay spontaneous find the traumatic part particularly among traumatic forget the non iatrogenic this will be very obvious the iatrogenic is really difficult at least 30% of the iatrogenic pneumothorax done in the ward or the rcu are initially missed and as we said if it is spontaneous then we go whether it is primary with apparently normal lung radiologically or secondary with obvious lung abnormalities so what is the clinical scenario primary versus secondary secondary has been very clinically important nowadays say 50 years back it was all tuberculosis obviously any patient of pneumothorax was given anti tubercular therapy that was depending on the pre test probability that time tuberculosis incidence was very high at present copd is poor with the commonest culprit practically we see them very few in asthma excepting in cases of acute severe asthma and that too we'll discuss later more comes to midestral emphysema like picture but copd and then with pneumothorax is a deadly combination of course diffuse parenchymal lung disease particularly if you try some invasive procedure they may go to pneumothorax and suppurative lung disease again just for discussion the most notorious will be staphylococcal lung abscess so particularly hematogenous staphylococcal spread with staphylococcal lung abscess we need to do chest x rays almost daily because at any point of time they may burst and give rise to pneumothorax forgetting that please come to primary so primary is young healthy individual without apparent underlying lung disease and the picture is okay smoking may contribute and there may be some genetic component like bartok dube syndrome or even lymphangioma hematosis how do we get a pneumothorax i was just thinking looking back all those days say last 45 50 years one is the setting community or clinic setting it is not really that rare getting pneumothorax in a community or clinic setting and there this is the typical presentation i am just coming to this so whenever you have to diagnose pneumothorax you have to diagnose it by a very good history taking that gives the clue then we look for physical examination to confirm our suspicion and of course dd is there so the history is like this now textbook say that usually the snapping occurs during rest but we have seen many cases when during strain they got a snap the pain is instantaneous sir localized and the shortness of breath develops a little later after few hours usually and what is most important is the sharpness the localization and the patient keeps the hand over the chest like this unknowingly to indicate that splinting or stopping the breath actually helps in relieving the pain and most important will be there is no fever 
if there is fever with this type of picture, I will suspect there is a consolidation with pleural inflammation. Unfortunately, many of them go to the cardiologist because no cardiological, no myocardial pain will produce this type of localized lesion where the patient can put a hand exactly that this is the site of the lesion and no effect of sprinting as well. And then breathlessness develop after some time. Cough is one of the components. Hemoptysis usually may be scanty, usually absent, but as I stress, no fever. And the physical examination. So this is again repeating because what is happening is the lung has recoiled inwards and the air is there in the pleural cavity. But apart from the air, the chest wall has expanded due to outward recoil. So there is expansion of the intrathoracic gas as well. So what happens, you get the other things. Okay, percussion, resonant or hyperresonant, but there is a shift of mediastinum even in normal pneumothorax without tension pneumothorax. So just a shift of mediastinum to the opposite side. This happens because the opposite of the pleural pressure is still negative. Here it is positive compared to the one. So the diaphragm may be a little down, Ministerial shift may be there, still it is not necessarily a tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax is diagnosed by its end organ effect, the symptom, sequence of symptoms develop and their rapidity. And clinically, in all cases of suspected pneumothorax, please look for fluid at the bottom on the back side. So you have to go to the back, Parkas from the top to bottom, and whenever you get the dullness, don't assume that this is the diaphragm necessarily. Do a shifting position and look for whether the dullness shifts. So all cases of suspected pneumothorax, look for fluid at the bottom. And in all cases of assumed pleural effusion, look for air at the top. DD we have discussed again. Actually, cardiological doesn't come in the DD. Pruritis does come. And again, pneumonia can present in this way without the breathlessness. It is the fever that distinguishes pneumonia for developing pneumothorax. What happens when we are sitting in a busy OPD? Pneumothorax comes there also. Yes, it does. And whenever they do in an OPD, they come with a chest X-ray. And the clue is never believe the chest X-ray. Number one, it can be someone else's. It has happened several times we have seen. And number two, definitely it has changed. Everything has changed by this time, if it is say, even two days old. So whenever you get a chest X-ray, a pneumothorax, examine the patient and repeat a chest X-ray. There may be appearance of fluid. The pneumothorax may have been larger by this time or may be disappearing by this time. So here I am not sure whether everybody can see this. There is a thin plural line here. So practically, the X-ray quality has to be good. Overexposure or underexposure, both may be difficult to discern. There is a thin line here. So this is the pneumothorax, the chink is outside there. It may be difficult. And then it is easier now, just you can do this if you have the radiological abnormality in your hand. We'll got to go to other views which are not really very contributing. So ultimately, diagnosis of pneumothorax is from history and confirmation is by physical examination and by radiology. So we have to go a little about the state X-ray chest. So what you have emphasized is this visceral plural line. So there has to be visceral plural line. And this line is parallel to the chest wall and it is concave outside and there is absence of lung markings, particularly vascularity outside the plural line. So this line convex outside, parallel to the chest wall, and no lung markings or vascularity outside the plural line. So this is standard presentation of pneumothorax. Compared to this, somebody has sent this in the OPD, the another pneumothorax. Here what we have seen, this is very much much concave outwards, very unlikely to be pneumothorax, most like a big bulla. 
what radiological imaging will help us in distinguishing between the two the easiest answer is to find a previous chest x ray so just have a previous chest x ray say two years back it is usually available and you will see the bulla was persisting there maybe it was smaller in size it has increased over the time but it is very easy to see that it is there and then you go go for a ct scan will definitely distinguish between the two other modalities we have stressed before lateral x rays exploratory films supraspinal lateral decubitus x rays actually will come to ct when you have ct in our hand practically we don't need all this and they are less sensitive and not recommended routinely based on current guidelines even exploratory films just have a marginal advantage over normal pa film in the world this is difficult so any exacerbation of copd which is not explained by the status of the patient should lead to a search for pneumothorax it is very difficult to diagnose pneumothorax in a patient of severe copd number one clinically breath sounds are very few but again one has to look for very diligently the both side axillary and infraxillary region for comparative presence or lack of breath sound on the both sides even x ray will be very difficult particularly if the film is over exposed frequently will miss the pneumothorax and if there are multiple bully so a copd is a real test of suspicion and confirmation of pneumothorax i put just a question mark there this is this is another thing we get in the word pneumothorax when someone have attempted pleural aspiration on the wrong side and this is rcu icu mechanical ventilation central line and now we are we are getting this number of cases in covid pneumonia as well and again at least 30% are initially missed so you have to be very clear again mechanical ventilation for example just the suspicion look at the waves to look for whether there is any chance of developing pneumothorax so when i talking of the clinical types okay when the pleural pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure we are stable pleural cavity pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure that is the normal pain any leak will lead to that but when the pleural cavity pressure is more than the atmospheric pressure this is tension pneumothorax just shift of mediastinum or said hemidiaphragm below does not stamp it as pneumothorax it is the end organ effect rapidly progressive dyspnea cyanosis market tachycardia and hypotension this is important because whenever there is tension you have to drain it immediately there is no compromise on that radiology again we are looking for air and air always goes up so pneumothorax in erect position will always see the air in the epicolateral here it will always go here same thing if the patient just lies down in the supine position air will be going up there yes air will be going up there so air in the anteromedial pleural so this patient i can see here it is probably 42 years male came with this x ray it is not our case we got them in a retrospect and there was a left sided pneumothorax as we can see a large pneumothorax and so due to any reason drain was not given maybe somebody thought the patient was not much symptomatic or maybe the recent conception that some large or moderate pneumothorax can be left for simple observation and this i can't show you the dates exactly but what happened next was this now it is clearly hydronumothorax the fluid was drained and you see the development of this what is happening lung always wants to contain the scenario so there is development of fibrosis pleural fibrosis so now it's a mess actually air fluid fibrosis fortunately still it was amenable to drainage drainage was given and the fluid actually came out the lung expanded 
But whenever the tube was withdrawn, again, it was the same thing. Why this happened? It is because, just see, it is because this X-ray was not just a case of pneumothorax. Here, practically, this part of the lung was not healthy. There is volume contraction of the left lower lobe. So this was actually a case of secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, not a primary one. And no secondary spontaneous pneumothorax can be left as such. It has to be drained immediately. Same thing, another aspect. This was sent to us with the diagnosis of a localized pneumothorax, as you can see, a thin line here, but very much concavity outside, outwards, very much concavity. Of course, you cannot see the complete lining, but this looks like a cyst. This looks like a bulla or a cyst. So what is the best way to discern? The best way is again to look for previous records. He had a previous CT chest scan. CT chest showed this, and the history corroborated. Actually, there was a hydrated cyst. Fortunately, which developed through just bronchus and he coughed out the whole thing, fortunately. And what remains is the persistent cyst here. This. So, no need of intervention. Better to observe and repeat chest x ray, say after three months or even six months, if the patient is stable. So a lot of radiological signs in pneumothorax are just where the air is. So air may be anywhere, but it is always going to the up. And depending on that, it is deep costopenic sulcus, lucent, sharp mediastinal contour, double diaphragm. So all this, where the air is. The easiest is this. We can see the visceral plural line. Again, you can see the complete one, convexity outward. No vascularity, no lung marking outside. Yes, skin fold is a DD, but honestly, not a very difficult DD because skin fold does not follow the anatomical contour, actually. Does not follow the anatomical contour. And they frequently extend beyond the chest wall. And even you can see lung markings extending beyond it. So skin fold is just DD to coat, not exactly a DD. Same thing about scapular edge. A good X-ray reader does not mind those aberrations. It is very difficult. Particularly in a patient of empyema and multiple bulla, if the patient develops pneumothorax, sometimes it is very difficult. We know that exactly the bulla will be concave outwards. The pneumothorax will be convex outwards. Still, it is very difficult. And we can depend partially on this, not completely, this double wall sign. So what we can see here, so this is a bulla. There is a thin line here, but there is air on the other side also. That means when we get like this, air on both the sides, this is known as the double wall sign on CT, is consisted with ruptured bulla causing pneumothorax. It is not 100% specific. And then this X-ray could have been missed because there is so complete collapse of the left lung. Apparently one may miss just see Thing, that it's a normal chest x-ray. But if you look carefully, all the so lack of vascularity is the ultimate proof. There is no vascularity here. This is pneumothorax, and this is the collapsed lung border. <coughs> Deep costopenic sulcus, we have discussed because as the patient is there, the air goes up. So here you can see it is the clear view of this compared to this. So the air is there, this is deep costopenic sulcus, but whenever you see this, don't miss the other one, this one. There is subcutaneous emphysema, commonly known as surgical emphysema. Lucent cardiopenic, again the air may be here, so you can see them very clearly, compared to this, you can see, or you may can go there. The air goes up, so if the patient is supine, you will see the mediastinal contour very sharp. This is a really clue, good clue to say, even in a supine patient, that there is pneumothorax, collection of air in the plural cavity, and look for mediastinal emphysema as well. Double diaphragm again, you can see here, the air is contoured here, it is, it is this 
pulmonary this is the diaphragm this is the lower lung border the air is here so sub pulmonary pneumothorax this x ray was very common say 35 to 40 years back <clears throat> actually there was a physiological explanation also we knew that collapse therapy was one of the treatment for tuberculosis when there was no anti tubercular chemotherapy and nature has its way of collapse therapy so any severe tuberculous lesion frequently ended in pneumothorax and just achieving lung collapse so here we can see yes so the collapsed lung again maintaining the same contour that is very characteristic of pneumothorax again the other lobe this is the lower lobe pneumothorax but the other side the non homogeneous infiltrations and again this type of x ray sputum should have been ab positive otherwise there is something missing you can see the fluid level also here look at this and see the next this now we see it has heavily expanded the diaphragm has been pushed down very much still with the fluid the hernias and that means the it has herniated on the other side you can see the air there so this is tension pneumothorax uncommon but again it needs immediate drainage this is another also very difficult to look at if we just look at casually there is no lung marking here but still you can see the thin hair line here thin hair lines here so basically we see this type of cases it is not that uncommon so bully multiple bully coalescent with each other produce this type of picture what is most important is not to put a tube on this putting a tube in a bulla will result in again involvement of the pleural cavity and hydronemothorax persistent bronchopleural fistula what happens if you drain late happens this so practically we'll come to that later whenever we are thinking of a large pneumothorax drain should be given if the drain is late and if you are not that hygienic in your approach in intercostal tube drainage maybe in the setting in the peripheral <coughs> field so lung has expanded but still there is a pocket there there is a pocket there small pocket and this is a small encysted pneumothorax <coughs> apparently patient is symptom late as present these may present with empyema necessitans say 15 to 20 years after this patient came in the middle of the night i remember probably something right 65 years of age very bad short of breath everything you can see the year actually it was long back no ultrasound those days and we see this x-ray black actually on both the sides just we can see some opacity here i can show you the x-ray there was a previous chest x-ray where the opacity was higher up so there was a higher opacity we just come here the patient is very badly breathless there probably is a little low breath sounds there compared to this is absent this is almost absent nearly absent so not much to choose for but no other way we have to give a drain we give that drain and as you can see now this opacity has actually gone up so this was actually pneumothorax with lung collapse now you can see here to here the patient was shipped predominantly clinically predominantly clinically because those days we didn't have the help of ultrasound and again it was i remember it was in the middle of the night and the patient was very ill quantification of the size again as you have said before so this is capola more than 3 cm is large less than 3 cm is small actually and this is the scp american college of chest vision in 2001 compared to bts here the intraocular distance at the hilum more than 2 cm is actually here it is large and less than 2 cm it is small so practically bts was more prudent because when you give the drain what happens that you do not hurt the internal lung organ this 2 cm gives us a cushion we can put the needle nowadays you don't put the needle we always put a pictal catheter 
but it was on this and also there was an assumption that time that size is the most important factor for draining a pneumothorax now we know the only size is not the criteria the symptoms are so size with symptoms determines the urgency of the drainage not only the size but those days size was the predominant thing so it was the light index as you can see so the diameter of the lung versus the diameter of the hemithorax you divide by them and you get this a pneumothorax 2 cm on the phs radiograph occupies about 49% of the hemithorax volume so that is the standard measurement there are other measurements as well this is also another measurement average intraocular distance you can go on the top middle low actually there are many methods the area method the collins method none of them are perfect and again everyone is useful according to the clinical criteria but actually only size doesn't matter ct thorax ct thorax is not for the emergency but it definitely helps number one you can see the underlying lung that is the most important thing as for example you can see here the pneumothorax you can see here the mediastinal impression chest ct is the most reliable imaging study for the diagnosis of pneumothorax but it is not recommended for routine use in pneumothorax it can distinguish between large bulla and the pneumothorax indicate underlying changes in the lung may be cyst may be emphysema visualizing the details of lung parenchymal pleura and particularly in trauma the other surrounding organs can be well visualized by ct and of course it can detect occult or small pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum forget this you can see this this is the tension pneumothorax complicating lymphangelial hematosis so anatomical dd pneumothorax is to differentiate it from bulla from emphysema sometimes from lung abscess or cyst etiologically even though you get a so called primary spontaneous pneumothorax you have to look for in the lung parenchyma evidences for cysts lymphangelial hematosis part of the wes syndrome this is the case of a 65 year female she had recurrent episodes of vomiting for last 4 weeks she was admitted to a local hospital this is after 4 weeks with sudden onset of epigastric pain after admission the lady developed sudden onset of severe shortness of breath so recurrent episode of vomiting for weeks sudden onset of epigastric pain and severe shortness of breath a chest x-ray was done in that local hospital this was the chest x-ray a diagnosis of left sided heart pneumothorax was done see at the chest x-ray diagnosed as left sided heart pneumothorax and they immediately drained the fluid about probably 1500 ml or something like that what happened shortness of breath worsened further on aspiration patient was shifted to our hospital gasping fortunately some of our juniors first put a nasogastric tube a part of conservative management and made the patient ready for intercostal tube drainage fortunately what happened the rails tube was post like this Where is my cursor? Yes. So I'm just showing you again. You can see this is the tip of the rails tube. So that saved the patient because nasogastric tube was done. Patient was being sent for ICD. We saw this, this here, and so what we did, you can see here. Patient was immediately intubated, but again. we are it was retracted so you can see here it was here and when the rails tube was retracted from the nose it went down there here so luckily this patient has a previous cxr done long back and there it was seen the left side diaphragm was not exactly normal it was a bit thin 
It's a bit off compared to the right side. Repeated inquiry revealed there is a straight fall on the ground from sitting position straight on one month back. A professional diagnosis are made of traumatic diaphragmatic hernia, thoracotomy done, and came out to be acute diaphragmatic hernia. I'll show you the X-ray again, just to remember. Yes, this. So all the clues were there. The clues were there in the history, and you can see the X-ray as well. This is another. This is being common nowadays. This is a patient of COVID-19, developing a tension pneumomediastinum. Now, this is another thing. There can be development of pneumomediastinum without developing pneumothorax. This is because the air dissects from this area, from this area in the interstitium to the peribronchovascular sheath, and they go track upwards, giving rise to pneumomediastinum not necessarily producing pneumothorax. Again, difficult to detect, but one should suspect. A little about ultrasound. Ultrasound is really very sensitive, even then CXR in detecting pneumothorax. Forget about the probes, but I always want to see, yes, this. So ultrasound is really because, again, when you look from this chest wall, normal lung, long axis view, the pleura, the visceral pleura is there. So you can see the lung sliding here and the lung artifacts there, lung artifacts there. If there is a pneumothorax, these artifacts will be lost. So when you actually, yes. So when you look from here, if you go from, if you go from here, the lung artifacts will like, look like sand on the beach. This is taken as the ocean. So this will be, the seashore sign. But if this lung artifact is lost due to pneumothorax, immediately it will change to just silent. This is known as the barcode sign. The seashore sign is presence of lung, barcode sign is absence of lung. And if you get a point where the seashore sign meets the barcode sign, it is the lung point. So yes, like this. So here, it is the, you can see here, here, there is nothing. This is the lung point. Ultrasonography is very important now with this for the juniors, loss of lung sliding, loss of comet tails, loss of scissor sign, and presence of barcode sign. Management, I am not going there because our fellow speakers, fellow speakers will do that. But again, the prime purpose is restoring air free plural space and to prevention of recurrence. And again, our whole accent depends on this. Previously to a size, symptom, size, and access to medical care. Restoring air people space, again, many things. Observation, because observation actually got a new boost after this paper. Conservative treatment versus interventional treatment for spontaneous pneumothorax. They did so that even moderate to large pneumothorax with observation, the resolution, symptomatic resolution at two weeks and radiological resolution at eight weeks were not much inferior compared to the intervention group. In India, whenever you see case of moderate to large pneumothorax, better not to observe, but to train. This happens if you wait. Oxygen therapy again, the simple thing is, Whenever there is plural air, this is atmospheric air. So the plural air, the pressure is 760. And the pressure in the plural capillaries in the normal scenario is near about 706, not much of difference. If we give 100% oxygen, the nitrogen is washed out and immediately it comes down at least say, the pressure diminishes by minimum 568 millimeter of mercury. So probably, the plural capillary pressure becomes something like about 150. And the plural air pressure is 760. So there is very good diffusion across the gradient. So oxygen is a must in all cases of pneumothorax. Optimal target fraction of inspired oxygen varies according to the setting. 
high FiO2, we give 100%. Somebody had tried lower, but never give high flow nasal oxygen. HFNO is not because that acts as a positive pressure ventilation. May precipitate further down the pneumothorax. Simple aspiration, good chance, but again, we don't do a needle. We always go by pictal catheter. And the most common complication of needle decompression is misdiagnosis, trying it on the wrong side. And even we have seen trying it on the both sides. Never do that. Tube thoracostomy, I'll stop here because a fellow speaker will do. And this was the SECB and the BTS. BTS has always been conservative in their approach to pneumothorax, less intervention, and a little about the air travel advice after pneumothorax. Taken all together, after two weeks of closure of pneumothorax, they say now it's safe to travel. But in a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, as the lungs is damaged and there is chance of recurrence. So recurrence is always there. It is about 30% in primary spontaneous pneumothorax, maybe more than 50% in secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, at least for one year after resolution pneumothorax, better no travel for secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. Thank you all for your kind hearing. Thank you very much, sir, for that masterly uh, exposition. As only you can do it, sir, which makes you the greatest teacher. Uh, and uh, uh, we have two quick questions from the audience, if uh, you would like to take them, sir. Yes, please. Uh, there is an anonymous attendee who has put in this question. Patient is having a left-sided pneumothorax. Then on which side it will be relieved on changing position? Now, uh, yes. Uh, that's, uh, that is the question. Patient is having left-sided pneumothorax then on which side it will be relieved on changing position? Oh, it is always the lung on the bedside who is the better working. So always put the pneumothorax on the top side, on the left upper. I hope that answers the question. Uh, the, uh, the next question is from uh, Divyanjali. Uh, she asks why air doesn't enter into the pleural cavity from the alveoli in normal individual. Pressure in pleural cavity is negative and alveoli is high. Why doesn't it follow pressure gradient? Okay. Practically, alveoli is an open air system. It has communication with the bronchus. So it does not build up the pressure. That is the thing. But it, if it does build up pressure, then probably at long time, actually, that is the explanation of rupture of bulla. So if there is small area obstruction, air trapping, sufficient pressure development, it can go to the pleura. But the safety factors are there. Number one, alveolus is an open air system. It communicates with the bronchus and outside air. It never develops very high pressure, number one. And number two, the coverages are there, the visceral pleura is there, which takes care so that it does not get leaked. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think uh, with that, we close that session and we will go on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. ML Gupta, sir, who uh, was my senior and I have learned a lot from him at PGA Chandigarh. And uh, he will be talking to us on uh, the insertion of intercostal chest tube. Now, before that, uh, Dr. ML Gupta, is a MBBS, MD, and DM pulmonary medicine from PGA. He's a consultant pulmonologist with more than 30 years of experience. His area of expertise are interstitial lung disease, COPD, asthma. He's a member of National College of Chest Physicians, Indian Chest Society, Indian Association of Bronchoscopy, and eminent author of several national and international publications. Currently, he's associated with the Santokba Durlabji Memorial Hospital and Gupta Chest Clinic at Jaipur. So Dr. Uh, M.L. Gupta will be speaking to us on the uh, treatment aspects now of uh, pneumothorax and hyperthermic, in particular the insertion of intercostal chest tube, when and how to place, how to maintain, what to monitor, and when to change. Over to you, Dr. Gupta. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening to all of you again. Okay. Insertion of a, uh, I'm audible. I'm audible now. Yes, sir. I'm audible now. Yes, sir. Uh, insertion of a tube is a common emergency which is encountered by the chest physician and often it is a life saving. And therefore, I thanks and appreciate Dr. Parko for include such topic in today's discussion and inviting me or making the part of this discussion. The allotted time 30 minutes is I feel not sufficient to include each and everything about the chest tube drainage. So, but I will try to answer or include most of the things which has, he has asked me when and how to place, how to maintain, what to monitor and when to change. Few things like suction system and that commercially available drainage system, I will be skipping in total and rest of the things I will try to include as far as possible. Uh, drainage insertion is required for the purpose of evacuation of the air or a fluid and so that we can help in the expansion of the lung and we can restore the normal sub-atmospheric pressure. By putting a drain, we can monitor yeah. how much fluid is coming, air is coming freely, bubbling is there or not, and so many things we can know by putting the uh, drainage. Sometimes drainage is required for the redirection of the fluid, particularly when there's a high volume chylus effusion or effusion is to ascites is there, or occasionally, post-operatively, the drainage is required. Chest tube insertion, may result in severe complication, hence indication must be very precise, treatment goals should be very clear, what we want to achieve by putting a drain, we should know. But before, but before, but, but, but before we consider the chest drainage, we should answer few questions to ourselves. First thing, does my patient need a drain? or would expression be more appropriate? The second question, does this need to be done right now? Avoid out of the hours putting a drain because it results in more uh, complications except in the emergency. And third thing, is there a sufficiently skilled operator to insert the chest tube is available? ACCP recommend 10 ICD procedures under supervised setting to establish a proficiency for putting a chest tube. Routine Prothrombin time and platelet counts are not implemented in, patient with, in patients without risk factors. If coagulopathy or platelet dysfunctions are present, they should be corrected. But uncorrected coagulopathy is a relative contraindication. If drainage is required, even there is a little bit coagulopathy is there, one can consider as a life saving procedure. Adherent lung to the chest wall is mentioned in literature as one of the contraindications. But I really wonder that. Uh, if lung is adherent to the chest wall, how the air or the fluid is going to collect that? <laughs> As regards the indications of the putting a drain, very few patients with a primary pneumothorax, they require a chest drainage. Most of them, they, are, they get relieved with rest, oxygen, or by the closed needle expression. But most of the patient with secondary spontaneous pneumothorax will require a chest drainage. Every patient with a tension pneumothorax or those patients have developing pneumothorax on ventilation will require a chest drainage. Similarly, the persons with malignant pleural effusion with empyma or a paraneumonic collection or with traumatic hydropneumothorax, they will also need the chest drainage. Postoperatively, we consider chest drainage after esophagectomy, corpotomy or a cardiac surgery and occasionally the bronchopleural fistula following the post pneumonectomy also require chest drainage. Thickened parietal pleura, positive gram stain or a culture of a fluid, empyma, localized collection. If sepsis is from the pleural source and if more than 50% of the hemithorax is filled, 
with a paranumonic collection, one should consider putting a chest drainage. If the pH is more than 7.2 or LDS is less than 1000 or glucose is more than 60, those form of the paranumonic collections rarely require chest to drainage. What about the size? It should be small bore or it should be large bore. There is no consensus about this. The small bore chest tubes, they are easy to put, they are less painful, but they are prone to blow frequently. While large bore drain, they drain efficiently, but they are painful, they need more dissection. It is not important whether you put a large bore or a small bore, more, more appropriate. And what you desire is the appropriate site of the drainage that is decided, that decides about the outcome. Does all malignant pleural effusion need drainage? No. There is an algorithm for putting a drain in malignant pleural effusion. The first thing, the person should be symptomatic. The second thing, his symptoms should get relieved with large volume thoracosynthesis. Then third thing, the recurrence should be within a period of a one month. His survival should be more than two months for putting a drain. If survival time, expected survival time because of the underlying malignancy is less than two months, probably we should not put a chest drain. But if you are dealing with a malignant pleural effusion, which is because of the chemosensitive disease, like lymphoma or like small cell lung cancer, we need not to put a chest drain. The effective chemotherapy will take care of that effusion. Uh, drain in persons with malignant pleural effusion can be an intercostal chest tube drain followed by a, chemo, followed by a chemical pleural disease. Indwelling pleural catheters are becoming more popular nowadays and they can also be considered. If a lung is expandable, intercostal chest tube is the choice. If lung is expandable or non-expandable, or there is a previous history of a pleurodesis, probably one can consider indwelling pleural catheter. I will come in little detail of this indwelling pleural catheter in my subsequent slides. There are various advantages and disadvantages of indwelling pleural catheters and intercostal chest drain followed by the type pleurodesis. Like improvement in symptoms are with both the things, both the procedures, but risk, but success rate, pleural disease success rate is more with intercostal drain than indwelling pleural catheter. There are other pro and cons of the different is on different issues about these two strategies. There should be a pre-insertion evaluation before we put a tube. There should be some short pre-insertion evaluation inform the clinical examination and review of the radiology. Clinical examination to have a two minutes just to examine that we are dealing with the same x-ray and same patient. And, and there is a, the first chest x-ray is usually the first investigation available on which we decide putting a chest tube. Sometimes it is a clear, a straightforward. Most of the chest radiology for the pneumothorax have already been discussed by Dr. Gosal. And like this in first x-ray probably we do not Think so much before putting a chest tube. This is the second patient which we had in patient with a, a, a obstructive airway disease. And one fine morning we find this X-ray. We are just planning for putting a chest tube. And opposite side there was also like this. But there was some reservation. There was some reservation. Uh, so we thought the better to have a CT chest before putting a chest drain. And we can see that this is the CT, this CT film is of the same patient. And there was an extensive emphysema. So whenever there is a, a, we find that there is a localized pneumothorax or there is a tethered pneumothorax or we have a suspicion of an underlying a bullous disease, it is better to have an further imaging in form of CT chest before putting a chest drainage. Bedside ultrasound is strongly recommended for all patients involving the pleural fluid if it is available. The clinical examination and review of the radiology can also be useful for marking the site of possible drainage when we do. Consent is mandatory except in dire emergency. And what we should do in consent, we should tell the person that what is the indication of the putting of chest tube. If any alternatives are available, we can explain to the patient. We should explain the procedure of the, we should explain the, the details of the procedure to the patient. What are the potential complications? and what will be our clinical course after putting a chest tube. As regards the position, this is the most common position, supine 
with a ipsilateral arm on the back of the neck, slightly rotated on the opposite side. This gives the best view of the shaped triangle for the putting a chest tube. The shaped triangle with the apex in the axilla, with the anterior border, with the lateral border of the pectoral basal, and anterior border of the latest muscle. The, the a line drawn uh, along the nipple side horizontally that corresponds to the about the fifth space. And that is the site or one space above that. This is the best site where we can put the chest tube. If we find that pneumothorax is, uh, yes, we find that collection is either loculated posteriorly or we are dealing with a, a underlying pus, probably the lateral decubitus position is the best. But what to do if the person is unable to sleep, unable to lie down? He is so breath that he cannot lie down for this such position. Probably we can use the sitting position for putting the drainage in that situation. Patient preparation before putting a tube, if the person is very much apprehensive, probably mild sedative and analgesics can be considered. IV access should be obtained and oxygen saturation should be monitored during the procedure of putting an intercostal drainage. For, there are different types of the putting a, uh, different techniques are there for putting a chest tube, which I will come in my subsequent slides, but all the techniques they require, full antiseptic precautions, cleaning of the skin, putting of drafts, infiltration of the skin, subcutaneous tissue down to the ribs and pleura with the, with the local anesthesia, safe local anesthesia, amount should be with the permissible limits, and before considering a putting a chest tube, we should confirm the expiration of the air or the fluid. If we could not get the air or a fluid, we should not attempt putting a chest tube in that situation. Chest tubes are available in various sizes and shapes. They can be straight, they can be angled, they can be with or without metallic progress. They can be they like Melikos catheters also. And uh, usually, uh, straight tubes are preferred, but in post op setting, curved or angled tube can be useful. For pneumothorax, a smaller diameter tube, between like say 14 to 20, can be considered, while in empyma or a hemothorax, a tube size of more than 28 friends is seen. I think most of the persons know what we mean by the 28 friends. If we divide this number by three, we come to the approximately the diameter of the tube. If a 28 friends tube is there, we divide by the three, meaning by the internal diameter of the tube, which we are using is around nine millimeter. There's a three basic methods of putting a chest tube. One is that with the help of the trocar and cannula. Another is the guide via tube thorpostomy, also known as the Seldinger's techniques. And third is the operative tube thorpostomy. The first trocar and cannula methods is not recommended nowadays because the sharp end of the trocar can cause the injury to the lung. So this method is more or less obsolete nowadays. Another method is the guide wire tube thorpostomy, as I told, Sildenner's techniques, in that the steps include, because it won't be possible to go into the details of the each steps, but just briefly I will go, just to make a small incision slightly larger than the diameter of the chest tube or the proposed site, then we introduce the 18 goes needle into the pleural space. We pass the guide wire through that. Then through the guide wire, we dilate the track. And after uh, dilating the track, we introduce the chest tube with the inserter, and then we connect to the underwater seat. The another is the operative tube for post me, or that is the chest tube insertion with a, a, a blunt dissection. The various steps. Other than the anesthesia, local cleaning, draping, and like this, the steps are skin incision, planning of a subcutaneous tunnel. Some persons do not perform forming of a tunnel, but with a tunnel, the tube doesn't slip out easily. Then uh, we create the subcutaneous tunnel, chest wall puncture, dilating the track, grasping the chest tube, inserting the chest tube. and but before putting the chest tube, we should just pass our finger, we should feel the intercostal space, uh, we should feel the pleural space, and if some adhesions are there, that can be broken. Again, some prefer the persisting string, uh, persisting sutures around the wound, 
but others say that only one suture across the incised site is sufficient. Persisting causes more pain than that of a, a single suture. Test to be secured and dressed will go. Attach the drain to the underwater seal and confirm that fluid and air is coming, column is moving. We secure the drain with one or more stitches. Usually, uh, silk thread size one uh, is sufficient and easy to tie. We style a, a dressing, apply the style dressing, and the chest tubes can be fixed to the chest wall by that omental tag like pattern of the dressing after drying of the skin and using pincer boundary is that tube doesn't slip out and remain fixed to the chest wall for a long time. The chest tube should be connected to the underwater seal systems. There are different types of underwater seal system. First, the one bottle system. In one bottle system, there is a, uh, the single bottle serves the purpose of collection bottle as well as that of an underwater. The straw, the straw which is connected to the chest wall, uh, to the, under, the chest tube, is dipped around 2 cm into the water level. So it creates an underwater seal system and there is a vent like that. And sec, uh, this is the one system. Another, just a twist time, just I'm putting this uh, under a uh, single bottle. Uh, is it okay or there's just some problem with that? So if our underwater is more like this in 20 centimeters, as long as the underwater uh, level will become more, it will hamper the drainage from the pool space. It will create a positive pressure like that of a 20 centimeter. So unless the person is able to generate a 20 millimeter, 20 centimeter of pressure in the pleura, the fluid won't be drained. That's why we keep the minimum two centimeter of the underwater seal. We do not keep one centimeter because the patient will inspire very heavily, then the water will go inside and the underwater seal system will. So it is around two centimeter we keep in one. Thing. But if a person is having a constant drainage, then the one bottle system will be insufficient or will not, it will fail, it will create the problems in the drainage. So if the person is having a drainage, a fluid drain is there, then we should have a two bottle system. The first bottle serve as a collection bottle and the another bottle serve as a underwater, under, under seal, underwater seal like this. If you want to put a suction to our intercostal system, then we should have a three bottle system. First bottle for the collection, second for the underwater, and third bottle for the purpose of the suction, like this. These underwater seal system, one bottle, two bottle, or three system, they are easy to assemble, but they are difficult to carry and difficult to maintain. To overcome that, and the person to overcome that, and when the person is not having the issue of the fluid, only the issue of the air is there, then probably the hemlish wall, a flatter wall, can be considered for that. It is very handy, and patient's mobility is improved with that. With hemlish wall, it is a flatter wall with the inspiration that flatter wall gets collapsed and the air doesn't enter from the outside. By doing the expression, when the pressure is positive, it gets opened up and the air goes out of that. So, in persons with isolated pneumothorax, rather than putting, rather than connecting to the underwater seal bottle one, two, or three, two, three system, hemlish wash can also be considered safely. Coming to the tunnel or uh, tunnel plural catheters, as I told, uh, discussed with the malignant plural effusions, in the tunnel plural catheter is percutaneously inserted for the long term chest tube drainage that allow the intermittent drainage at home. The common complications are cellulitis and clogging of the catheters, but serious complications are rare. In brief about its insertions, procedure is performed at the local anesthesia, skin preparation, draping is same as that of HS tube insertions. Then 18 goes needle advanced to the pleural space from the mid to posterior axillary lines. Needle is directed slightly posteriorly to help the positioning of the tubes. Then needle, then wire is passed through the needle into the pleural space. And after this, a, another incision is made 5 to 8 centimeter inferior, uh, anterior inferiorly at selected site. And the catheter is then subcutaneously tunneled through the entry of this one. This way, the catheter is uh, tunneled and is remained in situ for the long time. The tunneled tunnel catheter, 
other than the malignant diffusion can also be considered for the recurrent hepatic hydrothorax or for the congestive heart failure patient in selected situations. Suction to the underwater seal system is not routinely required and at least it should not be used for the effusions. For pneumothorax, it is not a first line management, but when it considered the, the suction pressure should not be more than 10 to 20 centimeter of the water. We start with a section pressure of 5 centimeter and then we can increase up to the 20 centimeters. Second thing, the suction tubing should never be left attached to the drainage bottle when suction is off or closed. This may create a positive circuit and positive pressure can lead to the tension pneumothorax. The suction can be the twin wall suction available in the hospitals or can it be commercially available separate suction machines, high volume, low pressure suction machines. Care after the insertion of the chest tube include that if when we deal with the effusion, the fluid should drain slowly, and not more than one liter in first go at a time, because otherwise the, the, the person can have pulmonary edema. Collection bottle should be emptied once it gets filled. Underwater seal bottle should remain upright and below the level of the site of the insertion of the tube. Otherwise, the water from the column water from the bottle can go into the chest, chest in the fluid space. In case of a persistent tube, the intercostal tube should not be planned. After putting a chest tube, we should get an Skygram chest to know the position of the chest tube. We should document the procedure in the uh, uh, patient's bed ticket. Relevant investigations should be done and analgesic, if required, should be given after putting a chest tube. So another this one. We have three set of the uh, this one drainage systems. Do you think all are perfect, or there is some problem with that? No. The drainage pipe should be should have an adequate length. It should not form a loop, or it should not fall in the floor like this. The A that is the perfect one. Is they should not be forming of a loop like this. I will tell why. Then, and it should not be fall or loop like that and fall on the floor. See, the driving pressure in from the chest to the, the, uh, the underwater seal depends upon the height of the uh, bed from the floor one. And it will be counteracted by these loops, ascending part of this loop and, and that of an underwater seal. If our underwater seal is bigger than bigger, or the loop is bigger, probably the driving force will become utilized to a certain extent. So while putting it, uh, when we have uh, this, one sucks, this one drainage pipe, it should not form a loop, nor there should be the water column, should be more than desired two centimeter of the water. Then how to monitor or how to carry chest tube? We should see three things, whether the tube is working or not. Is there bubbling through the water seal bottle or a bag? What is the amount and type of drainage from the tube? Bubbling, coming to the bubbling first. Bubbling in absence of a negative suction denote persistent air leak from the lung into the fluid space. A continuous or inspiratory air leak, inspiratory air leak is seen in those on ventilator or when a person has a large bronchopulmonary fistula. Expiratory leak, only expiratory leak is seen in persons with alveolar pleural fistula. A leak only seen during forceful cuffing suggests a very small leak or resolving expiratory leak. Leak is not only present with the bronchopleural or alveolar pleural leak. It can also be because of other reasons like that air might enter the system to the side port of the chest tube if they are not sufficiently inside. The incision given on the chest is wide enough and the air can enter through that. There's a loose connection in the drainage systems. And when suction is applied, bubbling will always be there. If a person has an air leak and on the mechanical ventilator, it is better to keep the fistula side dependent or high frequency jet ventilation is available with the center center that can be used in that situation. How to check whether the chest tube is functioning or not? The respiration water column in the drainage system should move up and down with the inspiration and expression respectively. 
on mechanical ventilator, if person is having a chest tube, the column will go down on the expression and will not rise on the expression. With no movement in the water column on maximum inspiratory efforts, the chest tube probably not functional. How chest tube is not functioning? Probably it has skipped out or kinked or tube or side holes are obstructed with clot of the fibrin and the obstruction with the clot of the fibrin can be taken care of by the flushing with normal saline, stripping or milking of the extra thoracic part of the tube or sometimes some persons have recommended the use of the fibrinolytic therapy to clear the obstructed drain. If all these measures do not help in uh, functioning of the tube, probably we have to change the chest tube. What to see in the amount and type of the drainage? If a person is having a hemothorax, the amount of the drainage is 200 ml per hour. Probably it is an indication for the urgent thoracotomy. Serial decrease in the amount and consistency of the fluid in a person with an empyema or a paranumenic fusion suggests the response to the treatment which we are rendering to the patient. Tube removal. Tube should be considered to be removed only when there is no fresh or altered blood is draining. When the lung has expanded and air leak has been seized for 24 hours. Or we can clean the tube, we can repeat the escagram up to 4 to 6 hours. If the, there is a no recollection of the air, probably one can consider the removal of the chest tube. There are two complications, but if done meticulously with the routine instruction to be followed, they are minimal, but it can happen sometimes malposition, falling out of the tube pleural infection because of the ascending infection, subcutaneous emphysema if we made a false track during our blood dissensions and sometimes injury to the intercostal nerves and vessels. With this, I complete my presentation and thanks again to the organizers for this opportunity and making the part of this present today's discussion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Okunar. Thank you, Dr. Okunar. Thank you, Dr. Okunar. Thank you, Dr. Okunar. Sir, I'm mute. Thampi, sir, I'm mute. I think Dr. Thampi cannot hear. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta, for a wonderful exposition of intercostal chest tube. You have covered, uh, I think, in great detail, all the uh, aspects of insertion, maintenance, and the uh, uh, procedure to uh, remove the chest tube, the indications, etc. And uh, I think it is very clear, and you have simplified it uh, uh, with stress on the practical points. Thank you very much. Due to, uh, let me see if we have time for a quick question. Uh, no, we don't have time. So I think we will go on to the next topic. Thank you very much, sir. The next uh, talk will be by uh, 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 Dr. Bartwal. Uh, uh, I thought it was Dr. Balmugesh on BPF. Have we changed the order, Dr. Partha? As per your program, uh, it was Dr. Balmugesh. So shall we go with, sorry, you're muted, sir. Yeah, program is Dr. Balamugesh next. I yes. not... So, so yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, so Dr. Balamugesh uh, uh, is an MD and DM uh, from PGH and Liga. He's a fellow of the American uh, College of Chess Physicians. He's currently working as professor in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, CMC Valor. Uh, he is a clinical and epidemiological and radiology chair at CMC. Uh, he is a radiology lead and uh, is a QC reviewer of radiograph uploaded for REPORT consortium since 2016. He is also actively associated with the Indo US collaboration uh, for TB research. So now uh, we are faced with uh, the problem of intercostal chest tube drainage, which I think Dr. ML Gupta has uh, simplified very well, but we often come upon complications which can occur in the presence of a 
pneumothorax or a hydropneumothorax and it becomes very taxing the presence of a bronchopleural fistula so how does one approach to uh, to the diagnosis of a bronchopleural fistula and how to manage it in the best possible fashion over to you dr balamugesh thank you for this uh, kind introduction and uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about bronchopleural fistula i bring greetings from uh, christian medical college bellur uh, before i go into the subject per se we need to be clear what do we mean by br bronchopleural fistula uh, because there are some other terminologies which can be confusing so what do you mean when you say that there is bronchopleural fistula it's an abnormal communication uh, between the airways uh, which means that bronchi um, main bronchi lobar bronchi segmental bronchi and the pleura okay so it is the communication between abnormal communication between the central airways up to the segmental bronchi and the pleura there is another terminology called alveolar pleural fistula in which the communication is from uh, pa lung parenchyma or airways distal to the segmental bronchi from the subsegmental bronchi onwards distally from the till the parenchyma and then the communication to the pleura so and this distinction uh, i mean many times people use uh, the same terminology bpf bronchopleural fistula for both these entities but the um, management the causes the etiology the risk factors as well as the management may differ between these two uh, so in this talk i will be covering both and if i say bpf management uh, it means uh, actually both but we need to aware that there is uh, subtle differences between both these terminologies when do we say prolonged air, air leak when the patient is on intracostal chest tube and there is persistent air leak as defined by bubbling uh, for more than 5 days it is called pal or persistent air leak and it, this topic is important because it can cause significant morbidity it can prolong the hospital stay uh, and it can even cause death coming to the incidence of uh, 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 fistulas in the post operative setting bronchopleural fistula is uh, reported up to uh, 20% after pneumonectomy 4.5 to 20% and 0.5 to 1% after lobectomy alveolar pleural fistula uh, in a post operative setting up to 46% after lung volume reduction surgery and 3% following bed resection the there are risk factors for post operative bronchopleural fistula like patient's lung underlying lung has been damaged by chemotherapy and radiation therapy patient has diabetes mellitus heavy smoking and copd with bullous lung disease low nutritional status which can result in poor wound healing residual tumor at the bronchial margin a large diameter of the bronchial stump uh, more than 25 mm or older age in alveolar pleural fistula it uh, in the non operative settings the usual settings is after a central line placement after a pleural biopsy transbronchial lung biopsy or percutaneous biopsy it can occur in uh, uh, spontaneous as a spontaneous pneumothorax um, uh, uh, as um, we heard the distinction between primary and secondary is uh, uh, coming uh, becoming less it can it can be caused by a necrotizing infections like a tuberculosis or staph aureus it can be a traumatic or in a uh, ventilatory icu setting it can be due to barrow trauma and in um, as we all know even in the covid ards pneumothorax uh, and uh, bpf can be found what are the features uh, if the patient has developed a fistula uh, it can be a source of infection patient may present with fever cirro sanguinis or purulent sputum uh, because the opening of the fistula results in the empyema uh, infected pleural fluid to empty into the bronchial tree and the patient suddenly starts coughing up a lot of uh, purulent sputum it can present as a acute respiratory distress because of two reasons because of the aspiration of the purulent contents into the uh, healthy lung or it can be because of the tension pneumothorax and we heard clearly how 
pneumothorax uh, when it is under tension can present as a respiratory failure. Uh, it can also present as uh, based on radiology. We do serial chest X-ray and suddenly we see that uh, the fluid, uh, the um, pleural flu effusion can suddenly change its contour and become it as, uh, uh, it's presenting as a air fluid level that suggests that the contents of the pleural fluid has spilled over and the air has entered into the uh, pleural cavity. And uh, this is how a typical uh, patient, uh, uh, the radiology looks like where there is air fluid level. It's called a hydroneumothorax or a pyoneumothorax and you, uh, the suspicion of a fistula developing uh, as the cause of this is very high. How do you die? Uh, how do you do uh, to diagnose uh, the, when the patient presents with the features of sepsis? You need to aggressively evaluate by doing the routine blood counts, um, uh, sending for infection parameters, blood cultures. You also self spend uh, uh, send sputum for cultures because that will give the etiology for this development of fistula. And usually after a chest X-ray, CT scan is done. And uh, if the cause is not obvious, if you develop a uh, the fistula after a biopsy, then if the cause is very obvious, you don't go on to do a CT scan. But if the cause is not very obvious, why the patient went on to develop fistula, then you need to do a CT scan and which can reveal the underlying cause like a bulla or a necrotizing pneumonia. And a careful analysis of CT scan with contiguous cuts can also show the uh, bronchial tree, distal bronchial tree, which is leading to the pleura. Up to one third of the cases, it has been reported. And these are two CT scans which shows that this there is a, a pneumothorax, a located pneumothorax um, here, which uh, shows that the um, medial segment of the middle lobe is leading to the uh, cavity there. And uh, here from the second CT scan from the uh, trachea, there is a fistula leading to the right side. What is the role for bronchoscopy? Bronchoscopy is not routinely indicated for each and every patient with uh, uh, bronchopleural fistula. But a patient in which you are finding that there is prolonged air leak, there is a uh, and there is a diagnostic confusion, then there is a role. It can be used for diagnosis as well as for therapeutic indications. For diagnosis, it can be used for localization of the fistula to look at the fistula size so that you can plan further management and exclusion of other causes for the development of fistula. Uh, bronchoscopic localization, if it is a post-operative fistula, then it is very clear cut. You can look at the bronchial stump, look whether there is a, any air leak. And this is manifested by continuous bubbles on bronchial wash. You install some normal saline at the uh, bronchial stump and see uh, for some time whether there is bubbling when the patient breathes in and out. And if there is bubbling, which shows that there is communication with the pleural cavity and that uh, confirms that there is fistula. The another method is uh, by selective airway occlusion with a tip of a scope or balloon catheter while observing the air coming through the chest tube. So uh, 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 there are various different balloons. You can even use the tip of the bronchoscope if it can be snugly fit into the segmental bronchi, or you can do the commercially available balloons like number five Fogarty catheter, which goes through the scope channel and inflate and uh, block the uh, segmental bronchi and look at the uh, chest tube, the underwater seal, whether there is reduction in the uh, bubbling. And uh, if there is more than 50% reduction in the number of bubbles per um, minute, which is coming through the underwater seal, that suggests that this is the most likely culprit predominantly contributing to the air leak. The other methods include selective bronchography. You install radio opaque dye through the scope and look at, uh, you need to have a fluoro for demonstrating that or selective installation of methylene blue you know, through the chest tube, you instill methylene blue and keep the scope at the bronchial tree, looking at each of the 
uh, low ops, low bar and segmental bronchite through which segmental bronchite the methylene blue enters the uh, bronchial tree. Uh, another method which has been uh, uh, dis well described and used successfully by Dr. Partha is uh, capnography, uh, which was um, uh, earlier published, where he used um, a, a catheter um, introduced through the scope channel, and in the other end of the catheter is connected to a capnography. And uh, uh, capnography, as you all know, measures the end tidal carbon dioxide, and uh, uh, normally, there will be some amount of carbon dioxide in the expired air, which will be uh, um, uh, captured in the capnograph as a, in, during the phases of respiration. But uh, if the air coming through is pure atmospheric air, then there won't be any uh, significant changes in the waveform. It will be almost flat. So uh, while doing the procedure, the chest tube is disconnected from the underwater seal and it is left open to the atmosphere. So the atmosphere where uh, uh, freely enters the pleural cavity and through the fistula, it enters the bronchial tree. And when the uh, catheter tip is kept on that particular segmental bronchi, which has the uh, fistula, the tracing becomes uh, uh, baseline and there is no significant variation uh, uh, with the respiration. And that has helped, um, uh, that can help in the localization of the uh, fistula. And uh, Dr. Partha uh, has successfully employed this to localize the fistula. Other methods include ventilation scintigraphy and computer tomography, bronchography, where you can instill the um, radiopaque dye into them a lumen and find, do a CT scan to find where the uh, leak is happening. How do you manage such patients? And if the patient has presented acutely, it is a, almost like a life-threatening disease. You need to uh, immediately uh, put your acts together and manage this patient. Because the patient, if he, the pleural cavity contents are spilled over, you need to immediately relieve, put a chest tube uh, to prevent further contamination of the bronchial tree. And the uh, patient may be in tension pneumothorax, so th for that also you need to do adequately sized uh, chest tube. And um, uh, uh, as Dr. Singh told, uh, there are methods by which you can assess the severity of the leak. One method uh, is the serfolio system where um, through the phases of respiration, you can find out uh, the severity of the leaf. The, there is continuous leak that is through all the phases of respiration that uh, suggests that uh, it, the leak is severe and usually occurs in patients on positive pressure ventilation. There are other commercial devices which uh, gives an idea about the severity of the air leak. These are costly. I have not uh, used it, but um, I'm sure people, um, you will be approached by these devices. If the patient can afford, you can use some of these commercial devices to give suction as well as the measure the air leak, which is uh, happening. To give suction or not, again, is in a, uh, setting a bronchopleural fistula. Again, there is no universal consensus. Uh, to, uh, if you give suction, there is one thought that it increases the expansion of the lung, the visceral pleura and the parietal flora uh, adheres to each other and this promotes healing and closure of the fistula. But the other side of it, suppose if this opposition is not occurring, giving suction will promote the continuous patency by sucking out the air through that hole and it will prevent healing. So what to do? So to start with, what is required is an adequately draining chest tube. And you just don't give any suction for the time being. And you see whether the on the repeat chest X-ray and then if the lung is expanding. If it is not expanding, you start with low pressure suction, uh, minus five. Then you gradually give more suction to see whether the lung, um, um, parietal pleura is expanding and opposing to the visceral pleura. But at any point you see that the lung is trapped, it is completely collapsed, and then you are keeping on increasing suction is not helping the lung to expand, then probably you should not be 
giving high suction. Medical management is very important. You need to treat the underlying condition, whether it's necrotizing pneumonia or tuberculosis, you need to treat with appropriate agents. Patient may be malnourished, you need to supplement uh, uh, good uh, nutrition. And in most people with uh, peripheral uh, um, uh, uh, alveolar pleural fistula, they respond to conservative management. If it is due to TB, you treat TB, you just wait giving good, uh, good uh, chest tube drainage and adequate nutrition and it usually heals uh, in up to 80% in some uh, reports. If the patient has developed fistula due to barrow trauma, then you need to have adequate ventilatory strategies to reduce the air leak by limiting the uh, pressure delivered to the bronchial tree. Other complicated methods include double lumen endotracheal tube or high frequency ventilation. If the patient has developed fistula in a post-operative setting, especially within the uh, initial couple of weeks, and we need to see whether it is an, he's a surgical candidate. And if the leak is occurring and the bronchial stump is not affected by the disease per se for which he underwent surgery, then a stump revision surgery is possible. But many people after this surgery, they are already malnourished, they are already in a debilitated condition and they are in sepsis, then a repeat surgery is not advisable. Coming to the bronchoscopic methods, various methods have been tried, sealants, sclerosins, and other devices. There is no controlled trial of one method over other to see which is the best uh, treatment available options. And all these are case reports or case series by different uh, uh, experts in the field. So one cannot say that, okay, this is the best method you should adopt uh, universally for all such patients. You have to see at the local uh, expertise available, the ability to manage complications, the surgical expertise available, and you need to uh, sit with the patient and talk to them about the uh, pros and cons of the treatment which you are going to take. One important aspect in deciding the management, whether the patient is fit for bronchoscopic treatment or not, is the assessment of fissure integrity. If the leak is occurring from particular segment or lobe, and if the fissure is incomplete, that means that there is a lot of collateral ventilation from adjacent lobes, then whatever you are going to do bronchoscopically, bronchoscopically may not be successful. So, that's why the assessment of fissure integrity is important. It can be done by two methods. One is, uh, as uh, I explained earlier, by blocking that particular segment or lobe by a balloon and see whether there is significant reduction in the air leak. Another method is by assessment of fissure integrity by CT scan, contiguous cuts. And there are some software avail softwares available who can, which can give a percentage of them fissure integrity. And if the fissure integrity is more than 90%, the bronchoscopic methods can be uh, successful. There are various agents and methods used to stop air leak, glues, ethanol, uh, autologous blood, metal coys, spigots, cautery, and laser. Uh, I, we have tried three methods which I have uh, highlighted in uh, yellow color, glues, autologous blood, and spigots. Um, there are stents, uh, 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 there are other devices available, stents, a silicone stent or a metal stent to bypass the lobe which is uh, causing the air leak uh, has been described or cardiac closure stents like ASD or VSD closure devices, unplaster uh, devices has been described and one way valves. Cyanoacrylate glue is uh, the is the most commonly used uh, agent, which has been uh, very well utilized, uh, used by Dr. Partha, so much so that we call, fondly call him the glue man, uh, glue man because uh, he has used it for various indications to, uh, to and uh, successfully he has published a few, uh, few case series as well. And in this, a catheter is introduced through the working channel of the scope, point five to one ml of glue is injected into that particular segment 
which has been found to be the culprit segment causing the fistula. And the glue polymerizes in the solid material in contact when it comes into contact with the body fluids or tissue. We need to be very careful that the complications include the damage to the scope itself. So the catheter has to be a few centimeters away from the tip of the scope. And you make sure that you don't give any suction immediately and you take out the scope along with the catheter and then you cut the tip of the catheter uh, uh, away before you pull the catheter out through the scope channel. Um, so th that is that we need to be very cautious, otherwise you can cause blockage of the scope channel resulting in um, uh, repairs. Uh, not only that it can be introduced into the lumen, it can also be injected submucosal, um, submucosally also. And this can not only cause a mechanical blockage, there can be an inflammatory response, mucosal proliferation, which heals by fibrosis, causing a permanent seal. And this is one case series uh, which was published by Dr. Partha of seven patients uh, in which um, uh, most of these had a poor, are poor surgical candidates with uh, severe COPD. And uh, um, uh, after a period of uh, three to seven days, he had success in all these patients. Bunton Abbey spigots can also be used uh, to seal the uh, fistula. This is one case which we managed uh, where there is a a large uh, pyoneumothorax in the oculator pyoneumothorax uh, in a patient with myasthenia on ventilator, and there is a uh, causing problems in ventilation as well. There is uh, the um, uh, the fistula was localized to the middle lobe. We tried initially installing glue, so this is the initial uh, procedure which we tried where you will be able to see that this is the middle lobe where we are introducing the catheter through the scope channel. You can see the catheter going and uh, when it is well inside the middle lobe, the glue will be injected uh, after withdrawing the scope, leaving the catheter behind so that the glue doesn't come in touch with the tip of the scope. And uh, although this cost, um, Temporary success, soon we found out that there are patients, uh, there is continuous bubbling. So next uh, we tried, in, uh, we took them to theater, did a rigid bronchoscopic intubation, and then we instilled the spigots into the middle lobe. You can see that the spigots are nicely, snugly fitting and blocking the uh, right middle lobe. Bronchial valves is the latest uh, in uh, armamentarium uh, for the management of air leaks. Uh, for prolonged air leaks, it has received the FDA approval for compassionate use. The principle is very simple. The, it's a one-way valve. It will allow the trapped air from the distal bronchial tree to escape into the uh, major bronchi, but it will also allow secretions to escape, but it will not allow to air when the patient inspires, it will deflect the air and then uh, uh, preventing the air to go to the uh, that particular segment, which has the air leak. This is a video taken. Uh, it's not at, uh, available in uh, India as far as I know. Um, uh, sorry, the video is not working, but uh, this is, um, a, it's like opens like a fish mouth uh, like opening and closing uh, when the patient expires. Let me see if it opens. Um, Uh, this is the you can see that the opening and closing during the phases of respiration 
uh, video was taken when I when I went as an observer to Heidelberg uh, Interventional Bronchoscopy Center in Germany. Okay, so there are some series on uh, success of the bronchial walls for air leaks. And this series shows that the complete resolution occurred in half of these patients with partial resolution in uh, around 45% of patients. Um, there is another series uh, which showed that uh, uh, 195 valves were placed in 75 patients and the median time for intrabronchial valve placement to air leak resolution was four days. Air leak resolution occurred in 56% of patients in one day or less. In rest of the patients, uh, there was um, delayed resolution of air leak. So how do you manage a patient uh, with a bronchopleural fistula? Uh, if there is a bronchopleural fistula, you need to manage the life-threatening complications like tension pneumothorax, aspiration, uh, respiratory failure. Uh, you need to treat the pleural infection with uh, adequate drainage. And you assess the size of the fistula. If the, by conservative management, if the patient is uh, responding well, then you need not proceed further. If it is not responding well, you assess the size of the fistula and uh, if the size of fistula is less than 5 mm, then you may be able to bronchoscopically manage. If it is more than 5 mm, surgical management you need to think of. Again, uh, if it is, this is for post-operative fistula. If it is an alveolopleural fistula, which occurs uh, in a pre-existing, uh, not due to a surgery, and if there is persistent air leak more than five days, and if the patient had spontaneous pneumothorax, like a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, you look whether the patient is a candidate for surgery. If it's not, you continue the chest tube suction, you treat the underlying infection, improve nutrition. If the patient has barotrauma, reduce the positive pressure. You look whether the air leak is continuing to reduce. And uh, if it is not reducing, you assess the uh, fissural completeness. And if the fissural completeness is good, as assessed by bronchoscopic uh, balloon occlusion or by CT scan, then you see whether he's a candidate for bronchoscopic management, whether he's a candidate, whether there are adequate expertise and uh, backup uh, plans are available, and then you can uh, manage accordingly. If the patient is not a surgical candidate, uh, then you have to look at, uh, um, uh, and also bronchoscopic methods are not available, whether you need to have an ambulatory drainage device or any other plural intervention can be die, tried, you need to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Balamugesh. That was wonderful, uh, uh, you know, coverage of the diagnosis and the approach to management of uh, bronchopleural fistula, which we see so often. And uh, very rightly, you have shown the flow diagram as to how to, or the algorithm, how to approach it, how to assess for fissural integrity before you go on to adopt uh, less than 5%, more than 5% uh, BPF or air leakage. And then you decide on the non-surgical or surgical management. So after that, uh, we'll take some questions at the end uh, because we are running short of time. We already overshot uh, our time. So we'll go on to the last talk of the day. Uh, this uh, is by Dr. Bartual, who is a dear colleague, uh, of mine. Uh, he's an MD and uh, DM and FICS. His areas of expertise are bronchoscopy, sleep disorder treatment, COPD, pleural diseases, and thoracoscopy. He has contributed in many research band publications, has been a medicine and pulmonary medicine in different hospitals for more than 25 years. Currently, he is the HOD, pulmonary and critical care medicine of the DY Partial Medical College, Pune. 
he has recently been uh, recognized and awarded for his uh, work by the Maharashtra state government for his work in uh, the current COVID-19 epidemic. So uh, Dr. Barthwal will uh, now tackle the problem of uh, the pleuro disease in uh, patients with uh, recurrent pleural effusions, the science and the art for success. Over to you, Dr. Barthwal. Uh, Dr. Vartwal, unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, you can see the screen, no? You can see the screen? No. You'll have to share it. Share it. Slide show. Can you see it now? Not yet. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'm going to go to Zoom and from there I go to share screen, yeah. Just a minute, please wait for... Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so from here I go to the share screen. No? Yeah, yeah. Have you opened it on your laptop? Yeah, I opened it. Go to the desktop and then share. Am I yeah, right? go, go, go to the bottom and share the screen. Share the screen, yeah. Open system preferences. Okay. Yeah, go down to the last line. And share screen written there. Just click on that. The share screen. Yeah. In green. Screen recording. No, this is security and where it is. Screen. Camera accessibility. Screen sharing. I'm going to remove the privacy part. No, if you go to the bottom, there are five, you know, logos kind of thing. Mute, start video, participants, and then share screen. A green box with the arrow inside. Achha, on you uh, Zoom on the... Just click the yeah, share Zoom. screen. Uh, share you're screen. seeing the screen with all of us? You're seeing the screen with all of us? Yeah, yeah. Go to the bottom, bottom of this. Yeah, go to the bottom. Share computer sound, optimize screen share. Ah, optimize screen share, no? Share screen. Share screen. Open system preferences. That is, I think MacBook has some different. You can do one thing. You can open your uh, talk and then just go back, close and restart. And the same share screen will come again. Aren't you? Able, I can't close this. Aren't you seeing the share screen logo down at the down bottom? There is a bar. Nah, yeah, share screen is there. Yes. Ah, click on that. Yeah, click on that. So it is yeah. coming. It is coming. Desktop one. So I clicked on desktop and got to share it, isn't it? So it yes. Is. I have to share my desktop with you. No? Yeah, yeah. the screen that comes, you share that. Click on that. So I got to open the desktop, isn't it? Yeah, first you open the laptop. Yeah. Open it on your laptop. Uh, allow go, to to share share screen. Screen. Go, go to share screen. Click on that. You will get a small picture of your laptop. Click on that. This is what is not happening. You are... I am getting location, contact, camera. Microphone, accessibility, screen, home code. Just a minute. Hmm. 
No, you see, when I go to the screen share, hmm. screen share it shows desktop. Okay, click desktop. Yeah, click desktop. It shows allow Zoom to share your screen. Yes. Open system preferences. I know if I open the system preferences, then this thing comes. Yeah, this thing comes. Privacy, location, services, and all. I think this I go to click. All you click yes, yes. Uh, okay, hello. Yeah, I go to use because of Mac now. This I think uh, problem is there a little bit. Just a minute. Just a minute. Six zero one shift. Hello. Hmm. Yeah. Zoom. Okay, Zoom will be not able to. Doctor Partha, if we email it to you, can you open it on your laptop? We open. Huh? Yeah, you can just um, uh, email the presentation. Yes, Doctor Partha. Tomar, uh, Tomar, email address. Just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. Tomar, email address. Just a minute. Yes. Yeah. Huh? Now, desktop. I can see. Yes, yes. I share that desktop. Yes. Ah, yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. The screen sharing, you know? Now, oh, where is your presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Ah. actually, security. I have to unlock the this thing. Yes. Okay. So you open that. Yeah. Open yeah, yeah. I, no, I, now it will open. Is it, is it seen now? Yes, yes. It is being seen now. You, you, you uh, yeah. Great. Full screen, Karo. Full screen. Yeah, I've done it full screen. Okay, great. No, full, screen screen screen. Screen. full screen. Full screen. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry for the glitches. I think because Mac has got some different system. Anyway, good evening to all of you. And it is a pleasure to be a part of uh, Palvocon with Partha because as you have seen the various speakers and all, uh, Partha always talks about practicality. You know, he talks about the issues. He picks up the topics which have got a lot of relevance and moreover practicality and uh, he has given me this topic pleurodesis the science and the art so uh, not only pleurodesis any any method or protocol which we follow in medical uh, science that is based on evidence science but it is not always science it is a combination of art and science and you've got to have that kind of combination so that we can have a practical approach, practicality. Because uh, I think if you attend uh, most, I'm not, I'm not critical of other conferences and all, but most of the time the speakers are, you know, talking about the review of literature, a lot of, uh, you know, literature review, evidences and all. So one, the audience basically loses sight of uh, the, you know, the real pearls of wisdom, possibly, which possibly you have seen uh, most of the speakers, I think uh, youngsters who are, uh, have logged in and they are watching this uh, Palmocon module nine, they will definitely be benefited by the practical issues. So I shall be restricting my talk to basically a practical approach. So uh, I shall be covering it in the first definition, then where do you do pleurodesis? What are the prerequisites? Which agent you use? Which method you use? And what form of analgesia you use? So definition is, uh, pleurodesis is a procedure to achieve symphysis between two layers of pleura aimed at prevention of accumulation of either air or fluid in the pleural space, simple, I think everybody knows about it. Now, where do you do it? The most important indication of pleural disease is seen in malignant pleural lesion, uh, which I think popularly known as MPS. Also in uh, recurrent thoracis, and also in non-malignant pleural effusions, which are refractory. We come across so many types of pleural effusions where we are not able to diagnose the etiology, the malignancy is not there, but we are not undiagnosed pleural effusions. 
where the fluid is you know accumulating <clears throat> recurrently so there also pleurodesis is indicated now in malignant pleural effusion the indications are that when there is a, a systemic therapy is not feasible it has gone beyond stage 4 or it's failed in symptomatic or recurrent malignant pleural effusion or recurrent thoracocentesis through catheter not feasible possibly uh, that kind of uh, you know patient is not willing or he doesn't have that kind of uh, help at home where they can drain it regularly or patient cannot come to hospital at regular intervals so there possibly pleurodesis is, is indicated in malignant pleural effusion now what is the prerequisite this is very important prerequisites for pleurodesis because if these these prerequisites are not followed possibly the pleurodesis will fail most of the time so the first prerequisite is that there has to be a full lung expansion and it is quite logical whether it is a malignant pleural effusion or uh, you are doing pleurodesis for uh, recurrent uh, pneumothorax the most important prerequisite is that the lung has to expand fully parietal and visceral pleura has to be opposed completely and what happens when the lung is not expanding when there is a endobronchial mass when there is a fixation of mediastinum when there is a significant pleural thickening like in mesothelioma where the lung will not expand or there are pleural fluid occlusion so you can see if you see the chest x ray and you see a pleural effusion and you see the mediastinum is shifted towards the same side it means that possibly uh, this uh, pleurodesis will not work because of these underlying causes of failure of lung expansion the second thing most important is that there is a significant relief in dyspnea after thoracocentesis is very very important it is not only the accumulation of fluid but it is the accumulation of fluid which is causing symptoms and that calls for uh, indication for doing pleurodesis now when to do pleurodesis the timing now suppose you have a patient you have a patient of malignant pleural effusion you have a patient uh, who has come with uh, recurrent pneumothorax and he has got a catheter or tube in position the lung has expanded completely and uh, in case of uh, pleural fluid if the drainage is as per the literature it is less than 50 to 100 ml but we wait for uh, around 100 ml and if it is 100 ml then you go ahead for the pleurodesis now as uh, dr amel gupta rightly pointed out whether you want to use the chest tube you want to use the catheter uh, there is no consensus uh, catheters are uh, you know less painful lesser invasive acceptable to patient but possibly because of the blockage and all they need a little bit more care they need to be uh, you know the patency has to be maintained by frequent flushing of the uh, catheters so there is no consensus you can put either a large tube or you can put a small tube now coming to the agent now this is the most controversial issue in pleurodesis it is not the technique but possibly there is hardly in the technique uh, in pleurodesis but it is the you know the agent which agent you need to be used so i have listed all these agents the agents which are listed in italics are the one which are most commonly used one is talc and is your iodo povidon betadine tetracycline bleomycin these are all cytotoxic drugs and silver nitrate streptococcus autologous blood diffusion all these things are not used so commonly so uh, there are some interesting facts uh, the historical facts about uh, pleurodesis agents in uh, 1960s and 70s anti neoplastic agents were the most popular agents and nitrogen mustard was the most commonly used and it was effective in 87% of patients but because of the side effects of these nitrogen uh, mustard uh, products it was replaced with the uh, bleomycin and uh, which was used quite commonly 
and uh, interesting thing was initially it was thought that uh, the pleurodesis was because of anti neoplastic effect of uh, the these uh, pleurodesis agents but later on it was it was found out that it is not because of the anti uh, neoplastic effect but it is because of the fibrosing effects of these agents the release of uh, so many uh, factors like uh, tumor uh, uh, your growth, growth factors then your interleukin 8 and all all these uh, factors they promote the fibrosis so because of this the the the, the this concept that these drugs can cause fibrosis in the 1980s tetracycline became a popular agent and uh, when the tetracycline became unavailable uh, the talc was used as pleurodesis and followed by hydropovidone now again there is as as i mentioned previously there is no global consensus on the currently available best chemical agent for pleurodesis now this is a systemic uh, review which was published in 1994 in which they found that in uh, more than 1000 patients that the talc had an efficiency the success rate was 93% corynebacterium parvum was around 78% tetracycline 67% doxycycline 72 and the bleomycin was the least and another this was uh, in 2003 there was another systematic review in which they found that talc uh, and uh, bleomycin are the most commonly used agent and this is again a cochrane database systemic review by ritesh agarwal from pgi and they also found out that talc is also considered the most effective chemical agent for malignant pleural effusions now let's talk about because talc is is supposed to be considered the most effective uh, pleurodesis agent so let's talk about talc uh, to tell you frankly i have used it in i think possibly four and five patients only so it comes in the form i remember our days in pgi i think dr amal gupta or dr pampi i think we we used to talk about talc so asbestos free talc was not available and we were told that there is some firm in ambala some guy in ambala that he is making asbestos free talc but we were not sure about it so but now the asbestos free talc is available and it is it comes in the brand of steri talc it is in 2 and 4 grams now this is 2 grams this is 4 gram it can be used as a slurry through chest tube or it can be used as a podrage through the thoracoscope and this is a this is a vial which is basically a uh, 3 3 g and it is attached to a insufflator which is passed through the thoracoscope and it's a, like a snow storm appearance comes and uh, you know pleurodes is done through podrage so i am talking about uh, when i am talking about uh, these uh, agents i am also including the cost of uh, the agent used and uh, possibly the cost of the overall procedure so 2 to 4 g cost around 3500 to 4000 and this uh, uh, podrage will cost around 5000 rupees that is only the drug so if you have to use it uh, in a patient possibly uh, the cost will go up to you know because it has to be done in an ot not in ot in a in a bronchoscopy suit so cost will go very high it will be possibly in a corporate hospital go 40 to 50000 rupees so it is definitely a costly procedure now there have been some some issues with the talc the the most important issue was that uh, it created it caused a ards like situation and this ards uh, was associated it was found later that if you have particles less than 5 micron so there is a systemic absorption of uh, these talc from the pleura and that gives rise to ards so if you have now if you have now the talc which is prepared is is prepared in which uh, 5 to 10 micron particles are less than 10% so the incidence of ards is is hard is almost negligible but still there is a problem that uh, you know you cannot be you don't know that uh, how good is the formulation 
and uh, how nicely and uh, you know accurately they are preparing this task dial can keeping the size to this uh, you know keeping um, less than 5 microns less than 10% in the tariff so this issue is there then uh, is there any alternative to talc? Yes, there is definitely a very good alternative. This is your IDO, povidone, 10% betadine. Cost is very, very less. It is rupees 80, freely available. And uh, we have been using it for the last, I think, maybe 15 years, 10 years, maybe 15 years we have been using this only. And it has been a very inexpensive agent. It is quite safe. Success rate is 87 to 93 percent in plural diffusion and also in pneumothorax. The recommended doses we use 10 percent. The uh, uh, this beta D, 20 ml is the dose. You mix it with 80 ml and uh, you administer it through the chest tube and also can be done through the thoracoscopy. And I think uh, all of us know the maximum work at this has been done by uh, PGI team. Uh, headed by Ritesh Agarwal, so we have been using this, and it has been we have we have we have found it quite effective. Now this is uh, this is this, uh, this is the meta analysis done by uh, Ritesh and all, and they have found in most of the studies uh, they found out that the efficacy was around uh, more than eighty percent, which is quite good, which is definitely quite good. And uh, the adverse effects are not much. Like uh, all pleurodesis agents, they cause chest pain. Chest pain is manageable. Allergic reactions can be there. And also in very few cases, very few case reports are there where possibly there was a precipitation of uh, thyrotoxicosis in subclinical hypothyroidism, very rare. And hypotension also was observed in a uh, few cases which was in, thought to be uh, not because of the beta dean, but it was, it was more so because of uh, vasovagal in nature. Now, other agents, tetracycline is not available, but oxytetracycline is available. I have not been using it, but some of my colleagues in my hospital, they are using it. This also is uh, uh, quite effective, as I say, 70 to 80%. And this is available in the form of uh, vial. This is 30 ml vial. It contains uh, 1 ml is 50 milligram. It is 1500 milligram. Dose is around 30, 30 to 35 milligram per kg. So you have to use one complete vial. And the cost is hardly anything. It is 15 to 20 rupees. And then comes your doxycycline injection. This is also uh, around 500 mg. This is 100 mg vial. This is a 10 ml vial. So you've got to use 50 ml. This is slightly costly, it is 400 rupees, while it will cost around maybe 2000 rupees. So I have not been using it. I have not used oxycycline. Maybe tetracycline we had used a long time back. I remember uh, when I was doing my MD, so one of us, so some of our senior chest physicians, they were using tetracycline. I have not been using it. I have not been using it. So which method to follow? Uh, um, uh, it is chemical pleurodesis or mechanical. So mechanical, possibly I will not be talking about the surgical issues, but now the preferred method by most of the people, those who have got accessibility and they have patients who can afford it, it can be done through medical thoracoscopy. But uh, medical thoracoscopy possibly uh, should be used and uh, when you are doing a uh, talc insufflation, which cannot be done through chest tube. So it has to be done through medical thoracoscopy. Now the analgesia, there were some issues about uh, using uh, NSAIDs. There were some studies in animal studies that, uh, you know, if you use NSAIDs, because the inflammatory response decreases after the use of NSAIDs. So, but Later on, so many studies, these are studies by Berkey, studies by Rahman, they have found out that it doesn't make any difference whether you use NSAIDs or opiates. So you can use NSAIDs. The only thing is that you should avoid corticosteroids because uh, possibly the inflammatory response will be slightly subdued. And 
analgesia, like we do a pleurodesis, we instill 2% lignocale 10 ml before we start the pleurodesis. So analgesia is not a big problem. It can be, uh, patient can be comfortable uh, when you do pleurodesis with any of these agents. Now, this is uh, one of our case. Basically, this was a malignant pleural effusion. And uh, uh, I said, because the lung, basically, the fluid was not draining and there were loculations. So you can break the loculations with IPFT. And once the loculations are out, so the lung expands completely and the pleurodesis can be done. So um, I think uh, these are the pleurodesis pearls. So pleurodesis pearls are that First of all, most important is that you've got to have prerequisites for pleurodesis. The lung should be completely expanded, whether it is a pneumothorax or it is a malignant pleural effusion, which is very, very important. Choice of agent will depend upon the cost, effectiveness, and availability. If uh, I was talking to uh, the guy who supplies this Steritalc in my city, Pune, he says, in corporate hospital, the, you know, the demand of Steritalc is, is quite high because there they will not do betadine pleurodesis, but they will prefer to do Steritalc. Possibly they have those kind of patients and they're working in a corporate hospital. So it depends upon the setting also. Uh, if you're in an institution, if you're in a government setup, possibly this may not be a feasible option. So what possibly the practically speaking, betadine should be the first option followed by oxytetracycline and talc because of the cost. You can use if the cost is not an issue, I think you can definitely use talc also. Medical thoracoscopy, as I mentioned, it is can be used only for talc insufflation and uh, ensure there is an adequate analgesia and avoid corticosteroids. Another thing which I possibly did not cover in my presentation is that if it fails, suppose when we remove the, we put the, uh, you know, pleurodesis when we are doing it, and uh, we, uh, we, the success of the pleurodesis is in case of uh, pleural fusion, malignant pleural fusion, uh, when the drainage is more than, is uh, less than 100, we, we presume uh, that the pleurodesis has been successful and we remove the chest tube. In case the drainage has been, uh, you know, more than 100 ml, 200 ml, 300 ml, one can repeat uh, the pleurodesis. Two attempts can be, I think, given uh, before we say that uh, the pleurodesis is not going to be effective. So thank you uh, so much. And once again, thanks to Dr. Partha for uh, inviting me to be a part of this unique Palmocon module nine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bartwal, for that wonderful clinical, practical, as always, approach to uh, pleurodesis, the various agents, the efficacy, the safety, and uh, finally, the uh, pleurodesis pearls, as you said, the take-home messages. I think that uh, it has simplified the topic, and I'm sure uh, most of our audience would have uh, uh, understood that, uh, what to do in such a situation. So having said that, uh, we have a few questions we can run through. So I'll just uh, take uh, some of the questions here. Uh, 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 the uh, insertion of pigtail catheter, what are the indications? So, who would like to take this? Uh, will uh, Dr. Eman Gupta, sir? Pigtail catheter is preferably considered when the, the thickness of the fluid is very uh, fluid is very thin and this is localized. Because putting a tube at an old site will cause pain. So suppose it is posterior loculated or apical loculation is there, one can consider the pigtail catheter, localized collections, and more so when the fluid thickness is thin. In these two situations, one can consider Dr. Park, this one, Dr. Another Dr. Question, Dr. question is the pleural fibrosis as complication of ICD insertion. 
Can we do anything to prevent the complication? You see, uh, you see one of that, uh, uh, those persons who had that uh, uh, IPC, that uh, tunnel catheter, without any prognosis, it was observed that around 50% of the patients, they have a spontaneous pleurodesis. So by putting a tube, by putting a tube, they, there is going to be some deep the pleural fibrosis that is inevitable. That is inevitable. That will be there. And it is better that to have, there is some deep the pleural fibrosis, so recurrence will not be there and the space will be obliterated. There is no harm in having some pleural fibrosis. Whenever there will be inflammation, some degree of the pleural fibrosis will always be there. Thank you. Dr. Anshuman Mukhopadhyay, would you like to take some questions for the panelists? Yeah, sure. So I think there's an interesting question so from Dr. Sridip Chatterjee. So if you do a pleurodesis through an ICD, do you advocate changes in position? I think I'll give it to Dr. Barthwal. I think will be the best person to answer. Yeah, definitely. Because you see, what uh, we generally put the this thing, you clamp the tube for four hours and you for... Every 20 minutes, you change the position. So some people say it, if, if it is a free-flowing kind of fluid inside and there are no and there is a, a position of parietal and visceral, it doesn't make much of a difference. But what we have been following is we definitely rotate the position every 20 minutes. You know, left, right, supine, pro, and all. Right. right. There's, uh, there's another another question. I think. Uh, if a BPF is present, then how long can we wait before we intervene? So that Dr. Balamogu should be saying. So usually till five days, we don't are not unduly concerned. We uh, do continue to do conservative management. If it is uh, persisting more than five days, then we need to think of whether I need to do something else. Uh, so it may be uh, changing the. Uh, management of the basic condition, which is uh, uh, produce the fistula, maybe it is an acrotizing pneumonia, not responding to the antibiotic by some other resistant organism. You have to start thinking about it. And then uh, if it is a, a, a fistula, which is a major air leak causing compromise, then you need to get additional support. You need to get the surgeon involved if he's a good surgical candidate. And you need to think about whether you need to do a bronchoscopy to localize the fistula. So five days is what is usually uh, given, but uh, you don't jump and do some aggressive stuff uh, after on the sixth day. But you start worrying uh, if it is more than five days. I, I think it's uh, it is quite sensible that in these days and times we start intervening early because when we have been students, we used to wait on bronchopleural fistulas for ages, uh, and especially in the situation where there was tuberculosis. And many of those fistulas healed in due course of time with a lot of pleural fibrosis, of course. But then uh, I think there should be a rationality and early intervention should probably be considered because in private hospitals, even if patients are waiting, they're paying for the wait. So waiting for 10 days, 12 days probably also doesn't make a lot of sense because that may, the wait itself may cause the patient uh, half a lack of rupees. So that uh, balance between when to intervene and how to intervene uh, has to be made. I think it's quite right that the principle is now uh, uh, earlier intervention and start thinking early. A lot depends on the cause of the fistula. Right. Um, <clears throat> so if it is something very treatable and this thing, then you don't uh, waste your time. You intervene early. But if he's a poor surgical candidate, when he's a high risk for general anesthesia, then you need to yeah, uh, do other measures uh, to make him fit for the surgical intervention if required at a later date. Uh, uh, another thing regarding bronchopleural fistulas is probably uh, the, the skill set that is associated with uh, intervening uh, bronchoscopically. I think that skill set is also lacking. So uh, I think uh, need for development of that skill set is required in our country so far as insertion of school or you know, whatever indwelling devices are concerned. Not that all of them are available, but 
I think uh, that is an uh, important question that all those who intend to intervene should know because spigots are foreign bodies and uh, uh, one who is intending to intervene may land up with a jumping foreign body from the segment with a BPF to someone to some segment without the BPF if the spigots are not fixed properly. So, so that is one thing. I, I have seen this happen actually. So attempt at uh, fixation of a spigot which is dislodged from the uh, affected segment of the bronchopril fistula to some other segment of the lung causing more problems than good. Is Dr. Thampi, any, any, any? Yeah, I completely agree with uh, what you told. Mm -hmm. um, we should not be attempting to do something uh, which can potentially, uh, which has high risk of doing more harm. I remember one patient in which we attempted glue installation mm -hmm. and uh, Soon after the glue installation, the patient coughed. And then the whole glue from the segmental bronchi was spilled over to the trachea. And the uh, patient was went into a sudden strider because it immediately solidified in the trachea. And then patient, we, had a, uh, we had to take the patient to theater to take out the glue which was solidified in the trachea. So we need to be aware of the complications as well. <clears throat> Yes, Dr. Partha, we, will, uh, we are eagerly waiting because you are an expert in this field. <laughs> what my experience goes that glue should not be injected or uh, placed in the proximal bronchial tree. Uh, on uh, intact mucosa, is, it doesn't stick for a longer time. And I applied it only in the alveolar pleural fistulae, alveolar pleural fistulae, not in the proximal fistulae. The amount of glue will be required much more if you are doing anything proximally. You have to make the surface raw to get a little blood being oozed out so that it sticks quickly to that. Otherwise, on normal mucosa, it will not stick well and the patient will cough it out within 24 hours, even if it's not been cuffed out immediately. Well, uh, the, um, uh, the cough reflex is uh, something which is difficult to suppress and um, uh, sometimes you need to do some maneuver for it. For me, it was best to do a xylocaine nebulization prior to. Uh, that's what we do for bronchoscopy, do it a little vigorously. And uh, a quick procedure is uh, good enough. And I didn't have any problem of glue coming out. All the small bits of glue came out later on. And for 24 to 20, uh, 72 hours, we saw some, um, some uh, jelly-like material being cuffed out. I think this is a broken glue. Uh, but uh, most of the time, the, pro the purpose was uh, served. This much I can tell you. I had no access to go deep into the lung and see what happened to the clue. But I did uh, repeat a CT scan. I found small specks of uh, shadows out there. No, these are not of uh, any consolidation, but could be a, a glue sticking to a small bronchus. And my amount of glue was never more than uh, 0.75 ml for any purpose. Uh, for one or two patient uh, hemoptysis, it was maybe around one ml, but it was usually much less. And it was usually peripheral. So this much I can tell about glue. I have stopped this for a long time. I hope that you please pick it up and make it popular because a very simple and cheap procedure and a lot of my patients may be, may be helped. So it's my uh, pleasure to uh, respond to your question. So. It is, I am grateful to all of my, uh, Dr. Uh, Ongshuman, can I make the final comment before closing? Closure. Sure, sure, I'm really sure. grateful to all my faculties, including you, Dr. Ongshuman, who has done that job beautifully and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I believe all my guests today have enjoyed their talks and I found that more than 100 people uh, were lingering on for roughly two hours. And this is what it shows uh, how beautifully you have placed your job uh, to them. Um, it was really a good session for me. I invite you all for the next session on next Sunday, which will be on um, research issues. Uh, Dr. Parvez Kaul, uh, my good friend, will deal with the Indian um, contribution in uh, respiratory research in the last five years. And with that, uh, uh, there is one more talk on the problems of research in India. I think this is very important for us because uh, if you look at the international arena, you find the number of Chinese and other publications are, huge, are hugely piled up. Well, while we are now still struggling to be visualized well, there may be many reasons for it, not just the reasons uh, related to us, 
but we need to be uh, tuned up. We need to be uh, in uh, in tandem with them, uh, doing research and trying publications. So there may be problems, and we know these problems, and people concerned should also know that as well as us. With that, I invite you for the next sessions. We'll be continuing PalmoCon for roughly another one month. And then, um, and every Sunday evening at 6.30, we'll come up with uh, one or other new topic. So I uh, welcome you once again. I thank you <laughs> from the core of my heart. Uh, thanks a lot for making this uh, particular module successful. And it was an opportunity to meet my friends uh, in a virtual platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Parta, and all the panelists. Thank you. Really enjoyed Thank you, this. Thank you, Parta. Thanks a lot. Thanks.